Welcome back, everyone, to Open Line. We have Barbara McGinnis with us. We are talking about elder care law. She is with Takis McGinnis, a law firm in Hendersonville that really um, specializes in this area. Comes on on a regular basis and answers questions about this topic, which is so tough for so many people. Let's let's go to Susie. Hello, Susie. Susie. Hello. Hello, Susie. Yes, are you there? Go ahead. Yes. I I am I, I would just like to know what uh, is, does there need to be community involvement with elderly elderly care whether it be in their uh, in their home or whether they are uh, in the care of loved ones because um, I've had two loved ones to pass away from being abused uh, and one was for money for the for the uh, um, exploitation so. Uh, that's that's something that I am looking at becoming an advocate to other people that are getting older, and I feel like the community as a whole uh, should get more involved in supporting elderly people as they, you know, as they and and what how how strict, how much better are the laws going to get toward this type of thing? How many people have to die in this type of situation before they start making this law a bit stricter? Because I I reported all this to the state and nothing was done about it and I as a result I lost a loved one. Where was the abuse? Are you I'm saying so it was sorry. in a, an assisted facility? Like it was in a facility? You don't have to name the facility. Is that where it, it was? was? Actually, just I won't say it any other than that. But it was just in the care of loved ones who you thought somebody that 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 that, that loved that that her loved one trusted. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. All right. All right. Thank you, Susie, for that call. Let's talk about that. She's asking about current laws. Do laws need to be stricter? What about this issue? I do think they're working on making um, the the laws related to financial abuse, elder abuse in general, uh, stricter in the state of Tennessee, uh, having the, an added penalty component if the person involved is an elder adult. Unfortunately, a lot of times exploitation is at the hands of supposed loved ones, family members <clears throat> that put, um, because the, the, the elder does not want to go into a nursing home, they want to be at home for the most part, they are willing to put up with um, some undesirable situations at home. And there's not good answers for that because even though like Susie reported that, if if the elder was interviewed and declined to uh, substantiate, I don't know that this is the case. I'm just thinking there's lots of opportunities for cracks to open up, right? I mean, somebody has to say that there definitely is abuse and the elder may be willing to live with that exploitation. Now, there are ways that as an older adult, we can, um, proactively work on protecting ourselves from vulnerability or people that we genuinely love and care about, protect them from uh, being scammed. Scams are common, right? There's all there's always the new scam of the week going out there. Uh, the grandparent scams or callers are wanting money because they're pretending to be a grandchild or romance scams are usually an email thing, sweepstakes, all of those kind of things. You just have to, and if, you, if you're vulnerable and you're lonely and you're trusting, you get sucked into some of these stories that, you know, the cynic that I am, I'm like, ding, done, you know, I'm not talking to you kind of thing. but. If you're at home alone, vulnerable, you can fall prey to these things more easily than you think. And we can use trust, the legal entity that is a trust to help um, separate, it sounds like I'm talking out of both sides of my mouth, but I'll get there in a minute, separate the elder from their money so that they are not victim to these scams and vulnerabilities. It does put them at an increased risk of exploitation by the trustee, the person that is managing those trust funds. So that person has to be vetted 
and you know, be certainly be a trustworthy person. And if an elder does not have anyone that they can turn to, that they trust, that's willing to take on that role, there are professional trustees that can be put in place. And there's even public guardians. They're not gonna take on a trust, but there are not-for-profit trust companies that might take a trust to manage for an elder. Some of those are some extreme situations, but there are ways to piece together resources to help protect people. Interesting, wow, okay. All right, that's very interesting. Let's go to David. Um, hello, David. <clears throat> um, hello, uh, my brother is a administrator of a trust, plus he has power of attorney. And he's keeping me in the dark about the assets in the trust. Is that against the law? What role do I you know have how much is in, in, the, the in the trust? What role do you have Are in you the, the trust? Are you the beneficiary? I'm just a trustee. I mean, I'm just, I'm part of a, I'm part of the trust. I, I mean, uh, is it, is it your mom or dad? Is it your mom or dad? Is it your mom yeah, or dad? Is what, yeah, my, well, my, my dad, he has uh, Alzheimer's, and, he, and he, my brother has power of attorney, and, he, and he's the administrator. And you don't know about your dad's assets? Right, because yes, because my, yeah, I don't. Okay, so what rights do you, all right, let's talk about that. Thank you, thank you, David. I bet a lot of people have that question. So you, well, it's a good setup to talk about trust in general, yeah. right, Ben, that, so first, Let's start with a trust is a legal entity that holds assets for the benefit of another. We usually use the phrase or the term grantor. That's the person that establishes the trust and it's funded with their assets. Um, funded means that we're taking assets that belong to an individual and transferring title into the, the trust. The trustee is the manager of the trust assets. Their, uh, their role is to then be a fiduciary to the beneficiary of that trust. So it's, it's entirely possible, there's all kinds of configurations here, but it's entirely possible that you have a grantor that funds a trust that trusts another person and trustee manages for the benefit of the grantor who is also the beneficiary. And if someone else, perhaps other children, or even further removed family members are remainder beneficiaries, there is the question, then what duty of reporting does the trustee have to remainder beneficiaries? Right. Um, so I think that's where we were with David. I think you're okay. right. What is, what's the I, answer to that? That's interesting. Yeah. So there's really no reason not to provide an accounting because you're going to wind up having to provide an accounting at some point in time in the future, right? I mean, David, I don't think, has any current beneficiary status, meaning the trustee really does not have the duty of loyalty to the remainder beneficiary like he would the parent, who's probably the, the current living beneficiary. But why not? I mean, you, you're going to have to account for how this money is being spent. Um, is it illegal? No. Is it not really the best course of action for the fiduciary that is the trustee? Probably so. The, the civil issue here is whether or not there is a breach in fiduciary duty. Is this silent trustee not managing assets well and uh, or perhaps even misappropriating that money and that's why he doesn't want to provide an accounting or are the remainder beneficiaries you know are there other issues on that side i mean what's the motivation for asking for the accounting also do we want to know how long mom and daddy have money that they can be cared for in their present lifestyle or are we really just trying to make sure that trustee is preserving an inheritance you know i think it's fair to look at both sides of that question right right but, but a trustee should be keeping um accounts they are supposed to 
you know, not the haphazard way most people keep their checkbook. Looks like, looks like I've got a balance, so it's okay to write this check. A trustee is held to a higher standard of record keeping, so. And who oversees the trustee? Who, who, who could come in the and current, say? The current beneficiary is the one who is, he, uh, holds a duty to. So you're, you've kind of, you've got the fox guarding the hen house with the power of attorney also being a trustee. Right. Okay. And it happens all the time, and there's nothing wrong with that as long as everybody's playing by the rules. Right. Yes, you have to play by the rules. Okay, we'll take a break. We'll come back, continue our discussion. I do want to talk about wills. We'll talk about wills when we come back. We'll be back right after this.